Right, I'm going to uh, kick off every uh, good afternoon. Uh, everyone, I'm Anthony Brown, I'm chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on the uh, And as such, the group, the first since uh, recess is on green skills and green education. Uh, when the committee members of the ACT met last year, it's one of the sort of key uh, issues that we wanted to focus on, and clearly it's part of the government strategy as well. Everyone's in favour of it. Uh, but what does it actually mean? Uh, I'm delighted to have panel speakers who are the front line of uh, trying to turn the rhetoric about green skills and green jobs uh, into reality. Uh, and th there's two main thrusts here. Obviously, there's the um, uh, education about environmental issues and climate change and just curriculum and teaching people about that. But then also equipping people with the skills for uh, the green economy as we go to net zero uh, by 2050. And that's where they've obviously. Uh, important possibilities. We know there's going to be a, a growth in the green jobs uh, in a range of different uh, sectors, uh, and clearly we need the people to be have the right skills for those jobs. So I'm delighted to have uh, a scholar at Westbrook uh, from Teach the Future, which is a, a campaign group to, uh, well, she can explain exactly what she's doing, but to, to uh, help ensure schools are uh, skilled, uh, teach people about uh, environmental issues. And uh, I think Scarlett's actually at sixth form herself. Now, so she really is at the front end as a recipient of it. Uh, and then Paul Turner, who's a geography teacher term, and uh, founder of uh, Teachers for Climate Action and uh, uh, climate uh, author, who's been uh, campaigning to get more environmental issues in the education sector. Uh, and then the uh, consumer of green skills, if that's the right way to put it, but Rian Kelly from the uh, National Grid and also a member of the government green skills task force that they set up uh, in the wake of the uh, 10 point plan. Uh, and clearly, National Grid is uh, having to adapt to the whole net zero uh, strategy and uh, presumably would be uh, one of the employers uh, of people with uh, green skills. I'm sure Rin will tell us all about that. Um, uh, we have one hour. Uh, I tend to be quite strict about timing. Uh, if you've got questions, uh, either wave your hand. I should be able to uh, see everyone actually uh, or put in the chat that you want to ask questions. Uh, and uh, that, that Q&A will happen afterwards. Uh, as always, I think everyone's done this anyway, put yourself on mute if you're not speaking, so then get feedback. And then I'm gonna to come to uh, to our speakers now to speak for five minutes or so about uh, what they'd like to see, what they think needs to be done. Uh, and I'm gonna to come to uh, Scarlett Westbrook first. Scarlett, over to you. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, hi everyone, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you all today. I'm Scala um, and I'm Head of Political Engagement at Teach the Future and also Spokesperson and Policy Lead for the UK Student Climate Movement. So part of the solution to the climate crisis is ensuring that the next generation are equipped with the knowledge idiosyncratic to understanding what the climate crisis means and what the possible solutions are, so that we can build a resilient society inevitable effect as well as a climate resilient economy that has a well oh, Scarlett, you've muted yourself. Got the wrong people muted here. Um, where do I get to, sorry? Uh, I, I'm not quite sure. I, to I can just start again. Um, so part of the solution to the climate crisis is ensuring that the next generation are equipped with the knowledge idiosyncratic to understanding what the climate crisis means and what the possible solutions are, so that we can build a resilient society that can deal with the now inevitable impacts of climate change, as well as build a climate resilient economy that has a well-equipped workforce to go along with it. As climate change is going to affect everyone, whether they're a builder or a banker, a farmer or a pharmacist, climate education must be intertwined into every subject in a way that's accessible for everyone, rather than just more content to memorise for exams. Although I'm only 17, I've experienced all levels of mandatory education, from nursery right up to A-levels. Age 13, I became the youngest person in the world to have an A-level in government and politics, which I self-taught, and this also gives me a unique insight into how our education system works. My experience of climate education is incredibly limited, and I'm one of the lucky few people who got to study the Environmental Legislation Unit of A-Level Politics before it was scrapped. Despite taking all subjects that have the faintest memory of climate change, I, as well as all students in England, have not once been taught about the social and economic repercussions that this catastrophe will induce, or what the possible solutions look like. We're also not taught about how we will be affected in a more personal capacity. From what we've been taught in schools, it's easy to believe that climate change is a far off issue of the global south. When we know that's not the case, 
And a pressing example of this is the recent climate change induced floods in London. The limited provision of climate education is rather shocking. And the fact that we're removing the climate crisis from the curriculum rather than increasing its presence is increasingly disconcerting. In research carried out by Teach the Future, we found that only 4% of students surveyed felt like they had adequate knowledge about the climate crisis. What we need is systematic reform, not just curriculum change. We need to ensure that climate education is no longer exclusive to those who take optional subjects, where it's briefly glazed over, but instead is centered in all subjects as the climate crisis is interdependent with the subject matter itself. Systematic reformation also means that academies and independent schools will receive the provisions we're proposing so that all young people receive the critical education needed to understand our current social, economic and environmental climate. Climate education should be extended to include knowledge about how to stop and abate the climate emergency and ecological, ecological crisis, deliver climate justice and provide support for students to deal with eco and climate anxiety, something which climate education will also mitigate as students will be empowered with the information to tackle the issue. In the run up to COP, we need to level up our climate policy provisions, and there's no better place to start than with the reformation of our education system. Democracy by definition means power of the people, and there's no better way to empower young people than providing us with the education necessary to live in a world increasingly impacted by the climate crisis. In our research, we found that 68% of students wanted to know more about the climate crisis. Surely we should use this enthusiasm to pave the way towards a curriculum that centers the climate. With a transformative education system that's fit for the 21st century, we can prepare the next generation of workers for the workforce and the economy that we'll inherit. Whether that's introducing climate apprenticeships in the renewable energy sector, or expanding vocational courses so that they cover sustainability, or changing academic content to give us a realistic idea of our world and subjects in their climate impacted context, context. By doing so, we'll not only create a highly skilled workforce, but we can create thousands of green jobs and set a precedent for the rest of the world. This would upskill our workers and save costs to do with tackling climate breakdown further down the line, meaning that it will benefit people, planet and the economy. We urgently need to see the introduction of embedded climate education and reform to the teacher training qualifications so that teachers are well prepared to deliver climate education. Something that's vitally needed is 70% of teachers feel like they don't have adequate training to educate students about climate change. By putting in changes now, we can work towards a greener present whilst working towards a better future, ensuring that we create the green economy and green workers of the future that, that we desperately need. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, and thanks for quoting your research there as well as putting the um, sort of statistics around it. Uh, so now coming to Paul Turner, one of the teachers, uh, well, former teacher, uh, and founder of Teaching Climate Action. I, I, um, it'd be useful to say what you think needs to be done, but also I think it'd be useful just to recap what happens at the moment in terms of teaching climate change. Who did it to some extent in some subjects, but I don't know, geography, but people did not. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Um, I am going to start though with something that's just a slightly uh, different with a piece of uh, A4 paper. And what I'd like you to do is just people on the call to in the chat, um, put down how many times you think I can fold this piece of paper until I can't fold it anymore. So if I keep folding it in half, how many times just quickly in the chat, put how many times you think I can fold this piece of paper. So Faye has put seven straight in there with the right answer there's a physical limit so seven or eight folds is as many times as you can you can fold this now imagine if i could keep folding it if every time i folded it obviously it doubles the thickness but imagine if there wasn't a physical limit so every time i fold this piece of paper i'm doubling the thickness if i could keep folding it how many times do you think i would need to fold it for it to be the thickness of the earth so have a guess how many times First number that comes to your head, how many times to fold this piece of paper so it's the thickness of the earth? I'll give you a second just to put in the first number that comes into your mind. 800,000 from Faye. Any other guesses, higher or lower? 87 from Andy. So Andy, you are very close. It would only be... Um, it would only be 37 folds for this piece of paper to become the thickness of the earth. Okay, I'm gonna just show you uh, an image. 
Now, here is an image of the Milky Way. Now, it would take a text message 100,000 years to travel the distance of the Milky Way, uh, traveling at the speed of light. Now, let's take this folding piece of paper one step further. Um, how many times do you think it would uh, need to be folded for it to become the thickness of the Milky Way? So how many times for this to become the thickness of the Milky Way? Have another guess, throw in another number. Thickness of the Milky Way. We've said it would take only 37 for the Earth. Andy has put 500. It would only be 83 folds for this to become the thickness of the Milky Way. And actually for it to become the size of the observable universe, it would only be 103. Now this is an illustration of exponential growth and it has lots and lots of associations with the coronavirus pandem pandemic and the concept of the R number, but it also relates to the climate and ecological emergency. What I just wanted to do was start by illustrating some of the creative tools that already exist that teachers are using to communicate and convey some of these fundamental ideas. So there is widespread, or well, there has been widespread media um, uh, reporting around some of the shortcomings of the current situation and we've had news articles around the BBC website we've also had particularly in Scotland some of their textbooks which have often conveyed um, lots of the benefits or the positive impact and presented these things as far more balanced than necessarily they are so, and there's been this requirement to talk about both sides when actually 97 98 99 percent of the scientific evidence suggests that um, climate change is human induced or the, the, the climate change that we're experiencing at the moment um, what we then did is we've taken this a step further and we've done some uh, some quantification we've kind of analyzed the current um, GCSE and A-level uh, national curriculum and also specifications. And we've looked and we scored them by their climate and ecological emergency score. How well do they teach these things? We found that biology is the subject that prepares students best at the moment, but the bar is pretty low. Um, there are though only four subjects that explicitly mention the climate and nature emergency in the current national curriculum and specifications. The way that we did that was we looked at lots of the semantics and the uh, terminology. We looked at, here's a selection of some of the key terminology that we explored. And what you can see is even at A-level, a lot of these words are missing. So all of these zeros mean that these words were not even mentioned in um, the specifications. Now, as a teacher, these specifications are really important indicators of what content should be included. So it's not, if it's not in the national curriculum, not in the spec, it is unlikely to be included. Now, the other thing I did want to highlight though is that there are an increasing number of people, organizations who are doing this at the moment. So I know Scarlett was saying that um, it's not the majority, but there are teachers out there who are doing a particularly good job and organizations who've been working in this area. So um, these, um, the reality is that we have the tools already. What we need to do is to scale this up. So we know what we need to do. There are lots of very good examples from all these sorts of organizations and people um, that, that show us how we can do this. Um, one of the ones I wanted to just pick up on is the Eco Schools Initiative has been particularly successful. There's more than 80% of um, schools in the UK who are signed up to this. And it shows the enthusiasm from schools, from students and from teachers at the moment, but it's what is that provision in terms of the eco schools? How could it be more embedded? How could it bring more? How could it be within the curriculum? And um, this is another example of what exists already. So um, AIM High is an organization that is providing this sort of provision. So we have the tools, we have the knowledge, we've got the people, we just need to scale it up. We need the support to make this happen and to be widespread. And then I just also wanted to illustrate another example that I'm involved with at the moment, which is called the Ministry of Eco Education. And this is a group of more than 160 um, organizations, charities who have resources, who have the tools and are scaling it up and spreading it across schools. We're working at the moment with only a handful of schools, but by next September, the intention is for this to be far more widespread and across the country.
So I guess I just wanted to finish then by just emphasizing that there are teachers out there who are doing this already. Uh, the, the tools exist. What we need to do is have the support from uh, government in order to make this more widespread and for it to be mandatory for all schools rather than at the moment it relies on individual enthusiasm and sort of slightly piecemeal um, coverage. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Can I just, before we come to Ray, can I just um, ask a question? I mean, the, the schools obviously have to uh, uh, provide the national curriculum, or at least uh, state schools do, uh, well, in non uh, And is it presumed, is, well, I'm just wondering what it is exactly what the government's doing. Is it to uh, put a uh, proper presence for climate change in the national curriculum, or are there other things that you think they're doing? Yes, no, I think the reality is this can't be done piecemeal within particular subjects, partly because it's such, um, it then means that certain students will miss out. So we can't rely on subjects like geography or the sciences to offer this. This needs to be embedded throughout subjects. And there are good examples of that happening, but they need to be scaled up so that every student across all school has this sort of provision. So it's some sort of mandatory um, across the curriculum expectation. Um, right, Ren, coming, coming to you, and obviously you're, you're an employer uh, and uh, you need people with certain sort of skills, but, and uh, you've been on the, um, the Green Skills Task Force, or you are on the Green Skills Task Force, so it's interesting to hear what you'd like to uh, see from that. So that's from a national grid perspective, but also the task force perspective. What do you think we need to do to ensure we've got the green skills for the green jobs for the future? Well, thank you very much for that. I'm really pleased to be here to talk about zero and some of the key employment opportunities, particularly for young people. Just a bit tiny section on uh, National Grid. So we're an energy company operating in the UK, the US. We deliver electricity and gas safely, reliably and efficiently to customers and communities. And we do this at the same time as making sure it's clean and we're heading towards net zero. In the UK, we own and operate the electricity and gas transmission networks. We call them sort of energy motorways, as it were, in England and Wales and gas for Scotland. And we've just bought um, Western power distribution, which means we now have customers in the southwest of the UK. So we have a rather unique position um, in the um, Britain's energy system. So I was going to cover three things. One is our research that we've done about the scale of the opportunity, talk a little bit about what we're doing and what other businesses are doing in order to encourage young people into uh, the net zero energy workforce. And then finally, a little bit on the Green Jobs Task Force. Um, so just on the research, we put out a report um, last year at the start of 2020 called Building the Net Zero Energy Workforce. And we did some research in that and found the energy industry needs to recruit about 400,000 jobs by 2050. About 120,000 of those are probably needed by 2030 if we're going to hit our net zero targets. And the great news is these roles are right across the economy, uh, right across the nation, and right across every region of the UK. So in a way, present quite an important, significant <laughs> tackle some of the regional inequalities um, currently existing in the economy. So just to give you some examples, the expansion of offshore wind and um, workforce attrition in the northwest is going to mean we need about 60,000 roles to be filled. Then the northeast Yorkshire and Humber will need to recruit about 40,000 more jobs to deliver offshore wind and some of the technologies like carbon capture and storage and support the decarbonisation of the industry there. And then in Scotland, uh, the growth of onshore and offshore wind will probably drive the need for about 50,000 jobs. So hopefully that gives you a sense of the scale of the opportunity. And I think young people are going to be particularly critical uh, to filling some of these roles. They bring with them fresh ideas, new approaches, innovation and new solutions, all of which we're going to need to get to net zero by 2050. And one of the other things that we're addressing in nat at National Grid, but also across the energy industry is diversity. We're not going to be able to fill all these roles and meet our targets unless we attract people um, who've maybe so far not thought about a role within the energy sector. We, we need people from all walks of life to help us with our net zero targets. Um, and I think then that there's a really important role um, for responsible and purpose-led organisations like National Grid here. And what we've done at Grid is we've um, published our Responsible Business Charter, which is our articulation of what responsibility means for us. And within that, we've then committed to developing skills for the future with a focus on lower income communities to provide access to skills development for 45,000 people by 2030 and 500,000 employee volunteering hours by 2030. And to do this, we've established 
Grid for Good, which is an energy industry community programme led by us to support socioeconomically disadvantaged young people aged 16 to 25. What we're trying to do is reach into communities that are overlooked or harder to reach in the UK and the US and support with training and employment opportunities to help them with skills and career development. We've run the programme virtually. It's about includes a 12 week uh, mentoring, uh, two weeks work experience, access to apprenticeships and internships at National Grid and work readiness, um, networking and industry taster sessions. And so far we've reached about 2000 young people. And that's in addition to all the things that we would normally do that other businesses do around apprenticeships, graduate training programs. Um, and I, I think all of this is designed to foster and shape the skills that we need uh, for the green energy future. Um, and it's always through a mix of studying, hands-on, um, and transforming the interests of young people in tackling climate change. And to Scarlett's point, trying to show people exactly what these roles look like and exactly what the breadth of these roles um, look like. Um, so I, I'm a firm believer that business has a real role to play here in attracting young people into, net, into the net zero workforce. And so my final point is, uh, for all of these reasons, I was pretty pleased to be asked to sit on the government's Green Jobs Task Force. And one of the things that struck me whilst we were on it and coming together with the report that was published in July was how much consensus there was across the membership from business, the education sector, trade unions and civil society. And so in our final report, we set out a range of recommendations under three themes. So first of all, we need to get investment in net zero. We need to understand what, it, what technologies are required. Uh, we need to understand how government can help. But the second bit is we need to then be creating green career pathways assess, accessible to everybody. And to Scarlett and Paul's point, it starts in school. You know, it starts, it's all the way through schools into higher education. And at the very end, you know, if you're already in jobs, but they're in high and in high intense carbon intensive roles, how do we reskill those people to support the net zero transition? So ensuring it's a just transition. And I think there's um, a really great set of recommendations and I think it's gonna help us get the right people and skills in place to meet our climate goals. Um, so I hope I've demonstrated in all of this that I think there's a really important role for young people. And one of the things we, we, we talk to young people um, as part of all of our work at GRID. And one of the things that we find is that young people increasingly want to have a job that does more than pay the bills. Um, they want to have a job with purpose and they want to make a difference. And this is exactly what I think a job in the net zero energy workforce does, but it's not gonna happen overnight. So one of the things that we've been saying at GRID to government, but also as part of the Green Jobs Task Force um, is we need to act now. We need to stop sort of talking about this and start making it happen. Um, and we also uh, need the government to put out its net zero strategy, which we're expected before COP26, because that will be a real moment to say, we're really behind this, this is what is needed. And now the business community can get on and invest and pull through the jobs. So just to conclude, huge opportunity, uh, lots of jobs emerging across the economy for everybody, particularly uh, young people. And I think if we're gonna come out of the pandemic and, and head into a, a recovery, we need to make sure that recovery is a green recovery. Um, and we need to transform our energy system and then leverage all of that change to pull through and maximise green jobs and skills. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I should say that uh, we're, we're sort of live tweeting some of this and uh, the uh, 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 Twitter handle is at Environment APPG. Uh, so you can follow us there as well. Um, Rian, I have one, just one question before we come to the sort of general questions and as i said if you if everybody wants to ask a question try and put up your hand alone if you've got your camera off uh, or uh mention in the chat that you'd like to ask questions um the how different are the green jobs from jobs that currently exist because obviously that i mean as a power company you've got a lot of engineering types and you know there must be a certain amount of transferability of skills or are they completely new jobs no i mean there are lots of um technical ONS definitions. And I think it kind of breaks into three bits. There's the direct jobs. So the jobs we'd all assume, say if you're doing offshore wind, onshore wind, electric vehicles, you know, the, 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 they absolutely deliver the technologies. Then there's all the jobs that go around that. So, um, you know, IT jobs or um, uh, data analytics, um, which are for us a little bit new. So we're bringing in lots of sort of different types of skill sets into an organization like Grid. But then I think there's, um, there's a, there's a whole load of other jobs that are just going to have a green tinge to them. 
Um, and in many ways, there's lots of research that would suggest everybody's job is going to somehow be affected. And the, the only other thing I would say is, um, particularly in an organisation like GRID, I think we are engineers and a lot of people have done and have engineering qualifications or STEM. I don't have any of those. So there's a load of jobs in communications, in the legal team, in the finance team, in the HR team, all supporting net zero. So I, my sense, my belief is it's they're a really diverse range of roles in uh, delivering net zero. Yeah, no, I, I, I was wondering the role. I was just wondering the degree to which you need completely spe different and specialist training compared to the sort of jobs that are currently done. Because clearly, in your role, just to pick on you, because you mentioned yourself as a uh, government affairs and communications guy, uh, you don't need completely different training because of wind turbines, or it is a completely new set of skills maintaining and building wind turbines. So, so in my instance, I, I am a communications a government relations expert and I apply it to the net zero world and that will be the same in, in legal and finance and people. But in the engineering business, um, you know, our engineers are having to think differently about the way they do things and new solutions, but we aren't specifically training them. Where at GRID we're bringing in the new skill sets that we haven't had to, before are some of the data analytics, because a lot more of our systems are digital. And so we need people and that's where we're sort of there are new skill sets emerging that we haven't usually typically had that we need to, in order to get to net zero. So there are existing focusing skills you've got on net zero and then there are some specific skills that will emerge and are needed now for net zero. Okay. I've got a couple of questions for Scarlett and Paul since the questions. So do feel free to turn your cameras off again. Uh, so and on Scarlett, I was just you, you highlighted a lot of the problems and some of the research that you've done at Teach the Future. I was wondering what you'd like to see. I mean, what, what is it in particular that you want the government to do? And then the second question I have is, is about, uh, you talked about more about sort of climate or environmental sustainability. Uh, um, when you get to the Koreans, we are talking about the green skills, which is about employment uh, in the future. And that's obviously slightly, I mean, it's related and it's a sort of pathway, but it's a slightly separate thing. And I was wondering how much you were concerned about the um that's a really good question so i think in terms of what, what i like to see in the curriculum is definitely like a liberation from what it currently is like just liberating climate change from the sciences um, like we know how, why climate change is happening, we understand the physics and the chemistry of it, but I think we need to look at the actual, you know, human um, reasons behind that. Um, and I also think we need to really understand exactly how climate change is going to impact us in a more comprehensive way and really put that into the curriculum. So for example, for my GCSE geography exam, I had to write an essay on how climate change will benefit the UK economy. Um, and that's a topic that I covered in, in my GCSEs, but I never once learned about how it's going to be negative for our economy, how it's going to be negative for our futures, or really how it's going to affect us in any capacity that isn't sort of really theoretical and scientific. Like we know that everyone's going to be impacted by the climate crisis, regardless of their vocation, and we need to make sure that every vocation is prepared for that, whether that's um, teaching, looking at like texts from people on the front line of the climate crisis in English, or you know, learning about the science of it in physics, or a learning about the historical decisions that have gotten us to the point of climate breakdown that we're at now in history and geography. So it's basically about making climate education more comprehensive, um, changing it so it's not just in the sciences, but it's everywhere instead, like a golden thread, we usually say. Um, and to do this, we need to change the education system, of course. And we also need to change the teacher training qualifications because teachers aren't currently adequately equipped to teach us this, um, as our research showed with 70% of teachers saying they feel unprepared. Um, and as for apprenticeships and thinking about training us for the future, I think ultimately all of our education goes into preparing us for future work. And there's also a significant proportion of you know, students who are in work and I know that when we talk about green jobs, we think of this as like only people in manufacturing, but that's not actually the case. I think every job in a green economy will be a green job, um, whether that's because we're using more sustainable materials or because we have a different ethos to what we're doing. 
And I think we need to maybe acknowledge firstly that a lot of people are already in jobs. Lots of 16 year olds will have started an apprenticeship um, or a BTEC in something like plastering. We can change that so that BTEC is about energy efficiency and you know making sure that we make do with our resources instead of teaching students to um, pick up methods that are really carbon intensive in their training. And with apprenticeships, we can create those jobs from age 16 because that's when apprenticeships start, making sure that they're green and so that we have um, the foundations for a green economy starting with young people alongside retraining older workers who are in the fossil fuel sectors I think is really really important um, and I think we'll say back to like how our education will prepare us for the future teaching us about the climate crisis will definitely help improve mental health climate anxiety is something that's really on the rise recently and I think a lot of that comes from people feeling like they don't know enough about the climate crisis and that lack of knowledge making them feel disempowered and scared and by equipping us with that knowledge we're empowering students and also tackling those mental health problems which will again um, lead to being better workers and more efficient. Thank you. Coming to Paul, we touched on when, when you spoke earlier, you touched on the uh, overall context of national curriculum. But it, if we had, uh, we don't, we don't have to make it the schools minister here, but if we did and we can pass the message on, what is it that you'd like to see the government actually do in terms of support for teachers? Uh, and uh, Scarlett mentioned uh, the need to change teacher training there. Do you think that's the case as well? I was wondering what actual sort of practical measures you think need to be taken. Yeah, so I would say that you know all teachers in their teacher training have elements of um, sort of modules and testing that they have to do that are compulsory, often based around numeracy and literacy. It would be very easy overnight to be able to add on a module that was a uh, climate and nature emergency or was an element that fundamental to, to a core knowledge. And again, as I've said, there's organizations who have that, you know, it could be done overnight. It would just mean that um, train you know teacher training organizations would then have to to make sure that happens and again there are organizations doing that it just needs to be scaled up um the thing i also though wanted to mention is that green jobs is an aspect of this i think it's important to understand how education prepares young people to engage fully in society and, and just as scarlett was saying there it's all about also um realizing young people as having agency and uh, kind of already participating in society even whilst they're in school and i think it's important what we're also suggesting then is to go beyond the mechanistic and the scientific which is is potentially where we are at at the moment but instead thinking more broadly about society um, in terms of mitigation adaptation understanding how um, society may need to shift and i think uh, schools have the potential to play a really fundamental role in that at at scale in the sense that they can be a bridge between the individual and the national so schools are already the hub of the community and we could use schools in a kind of increasingly facilitator role both providing education for older generations to upskill them um, and also to to bridge that gap between generations um, and to, to engage communities in um becoming more sustainable. Yeah, no, I certainly agree, agree with that. Um, I'm going to come to Joe, actually. Go to, turn this camera on, but yeah, he came up with a question. Which I thought it was a good one to ask it. Yeah, hi guys. Um, <clears throat> my name is Joe Tetlow, I'm at Green Alliance and also help direct the um, Environment APG along with Anthony. Um, my question um, is for all the panelists, and it's basically about careers advice um, and whether you think green jobs themselves are too ill-defined. Often when you get careers advice at school or college or university, you might want to look at being a lawyer or an accountant or something like that. So I suppose the question is, how do you think green jobs um, kind of fits into careers advice when, when people are looking at careers? And, or, or is it just STEM subjects like we've already touched upon? Um, What's, what's, what's your best advice about how to attack that? And probably going to Rianne first, I think, um, just from a yeah, green so, um, jobs task force perspective. So I do like the term green jobs because I frankly think it sounds more interesting than some of the made, more, more traditional language, but I kind of think we can't say it's everything. So you might we might need to say it's green jobs and that becomes an entry point to specific sectors where there are jobs that are green. The other, the other thing that I was thinking is, um, and plays to this to the language. I mean, I think when I was at school, engineering probably seemed quite dull. And now I'm sitting at grid, I'm like, well, I wish I'd kind of known then what these jobs deliver. 
and how exciting they are and they might it might not have, we could have sold it differently so if green jobs gets people excited and allows people to think more laterally about the sorts of things they want to do then we should use it but we also do need to make clear that be a little specific so that it doesn't become everything and nothing if that's a helpful answer but it's the it's the it's the the comms person in me says green jobs is a better pitch it does cover a wide variety of um, uh, careers choice um, you had your hand up we can't see you but i can see your yellow hand um, I think, again, green jobs is a really, really good phrase, and, but I also do think that we need to liberate it from, again, just manufacturing and engineering. Um, for example, disabled people are going to be disproportionately impacted by the climate crisis, so that means jobs in social care are green jobs because, you know, people will be caring for those impacted disproportionately by the climate crisis. The same goes to medics and people working in healthcare. Um, obviously, we have things like engineering and building infrastructure and manufacturing that also counts as green jobs but even you know things like lawyers if they're fighting against oil companies breaking legislation um, and polluting that's again a green job I think we need to go into how we view green jobs with a 21st century approach um, and realize that to create a green economy every worker has to be part of that and that means that everyone is going to play some sort of role in that green economy and although it might not be as um, explicit as building renewable energy sources. It's still a valuable part. Um, and then on careers advice in schools, obviously I'm in school right now. I don't think I've ever heard of anyone um, be pitched green jobs as, as a concept. I've definitely, you know, heard of my friends being told to take up apprenticeships in renewable energy-esque sort of things or practical vocational courses, but the phrasing of green jobs has never been one that's been used. And I think that's really interesting, especially given how active my generation in particular have been with the climate. And, you know, you'd think that teachers or careers advisors even would engage more with that. But I think that because perhaps the provision is so low of what that looks like um, from the government, when we get those like packs of what jobs you can do when you're older, um, that's stopping us from that happening. I come to you all on this. Uh, green jobs career advice point. I assume many of your people say, uh, end up getting careers, careers advice. Do you think it's helpful having a separate section that is just green jobs, or is it so wide? Lots of everything from social care to lawyers and uh, everything in between. I, I think, I guess I agree with Rian, Rian and the, 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 it's useful as a terminology to emphasise how a lot of these jobs are, are, are shifting their focus and, and that there are certain very specific skills that are needed with that perspective. I mean, well, what I would say is that increasingly schools are having um, events, speakers and hosting careers affairs, um, careers fairs that have these uh, agendas that are focused towards green uh, events. I think there's definitely the case where uh, increasingly uh, businesses could help Help connect that and realize they're working with um, schools in their local area and helping people to realize those jobs exist. Um, I'm sure there's lots of examples of those things already happening, but again, it's, it's the idea of scale. If I may, I just wanted to come in. I've, I've just put my hand up because um, just I have a seven year old when she was five she did a school play at the end of the year and talking about climate change um, and it was as much informative for the kids in the class as it was for the parents in the audience so I don't I wanted to show a bit of optimism that somewhere somehow this is circulating through and my five-year-old is now a seven-year-old and talks about climate change so we're doing something right in some places but there's a lot further to go but I just wanted to see that because I think it, it's not all it, it, there are good things happening in some in schools yeah, uh, I should say, as a father of two children, we have certainly learned quite a lot about climate change. And it seems like, anyway, they've certainly learned a lot from somewhere. Uh, Paul. I just wanted to feed on from that point as well. I think increasingly teachers realise, uh, and I think we've always known that, what, what happens in the classroom is discussed at the breakfast table or the dinner table. Schools are the perfect avenue to engage with wider society. So to use schools and teachers as what is often perceived as a very neutral uh, ground to actually engage in discussion um, around these issues and then bring in families. And that might mean, as I've done previously, hosting um, lessons for parents so inviting in parents in the evening and, and engaging them with the material that you're then teaching children um and, and again that can be scaled up and and you can do events for the whole community that then increase their knowledge very rapidly around these sorts of ideas 
That's absolutely true. And one of the things we said in the task force report is you need to bring guardians and parents along and carers along with you, because what you don't want is we use the words scarlet green jobs, kids, people, young people go home and parents say, oh, I don't want guardians or carers say, oh, I'm rubbish, don't want to go in there. We, you know, we need everybody actually to say, no, these are really cool jobs. You, you, that you want to be in this, the, these jobs. Yeah. Um, Katie Sports, you just made a point. I don't know if you want to ask a question about this. Sorry, I can't really hear very well. I said, if you want to, you made a, uh, a sort of very, very point in the chat. You just, I don't know if you want to ask a question or to elaborate on that point. Uh, oh, yeah. It, it was just a comment really that often in a lot of the discussions around kind of green jobs and focus does tend to be quite heavily on kind of how we get to net zero and it was mainly just kind of a plug to say you know green jobs are also things like peatland restoration nature-based solutions all of that kind of thing and you know the more that we can invest in nature um the more i think someone made the point that you know lots of jobs won't be kind of available over the next 20 years because of the direction that we're that we're heading in and actually if we can keep investing in nature and um, restoring our, you know, habitats and environment, then, you know, this is an area where we can actually create create more jobs. Um, and I think there's also an important point as well around sort of diversity in, in these types of roles at the moment. It's, as we know, the environment sector is very heavily kind of, it's very white. And I think part of just linking into the conversations that we had before about kind of career opportunities, that kind of thing. It's making sure that these opportunities are presented to everybody. So not just, you know, middle-class students, also students from underprivileged backgrounds and, um, you know, across all sectors of, of society so that everybody can can be involved. And you're absolutely right on I know in Canberra actually they've got quite a lot of uh, students tend to go out and do those sort of environmental jobs and often they progress them in a way at scale that we don't have in this country. Um, Joe Tetzler again, you're asking um, two questions. Yeah, sorry, I just got another question. Um, whilst there's room to ask. Um, what role is there for retraining? Because we're looking a lot at kind of school education at the moment and climate education being on the curriculum. Um, but obviously careers change quite a lot these days. Um, so I suppose as the, as the task force looked at what, what's needed in terms of funding, um, if jobs become redundant and people need to retrain and, and get the skills needed to, to have uh, careers in, in, in other jobs. So yeah, have, have the task force looked at that and also have National Grid looked at that as well in terms of uh, what, what offer is out there for, for people looking to retrain? Yeah, so there's a, it was a big focus of the task force conversation and the whole of the third section is on a just transition. And it's exactly that. How do we make sure that anybody who today is in a high carbon industry, how do we support them transitioning away? And we had some of we had BP on the task force as well. To, and I think Tata Steel were on there as well to try and help because clearly they're they're in industries where they have parts or all of them as, as in, high, in, the high, in high carbon sectors. Um, so yeah, and we and we work with the unions a lot on that to make sure um, that those reskilling programs are in place. Um, we we to be honest, we don't have that problem in National Grid at the moment, and um, we you know we we run the gas transmission network. But what we're finding is that the the people who know all about the gas transmission network are exactly the same people who we need to understand how you convert it to hydrogen, and 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 take the carbon out. Um, but we're always looking for bringing people in from other sectors to help us and to sort of create that diversity. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's that's an answer from Grid, but also it was a major preoccupation of the uh, uh, Green Jobs Task, which is exactly why there's a final chapter on it or a final section on it. Uh, Joe, you, you had a question about careers, actually, and I, I'm going to attempt an answer, although it's not an easy, not an easy one. Should your question was should should we be advertising careers now that we know might not exist in the future? Um, I, 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 think, um, I think probably that's inevitable, but I also think probably people going into those section, sectors of the economy probably already know that, and the businesses in those, economy, in those sectors of the economy already know it and are already having to address it, because if they don't address it deliberately, they won't bring in the talent and they won't retain the talent. So I, I think it will, it, it's some, 
I think it is happening anyway, if you see what I mean. And I think that doesn't mean to say you couldn't have a career in those sectors. It just means you need to think through how long you might have a career in that sector. So I don't want people thinking, well, if it's high carbon now, I'm not going into it. So I think that's the wrong answer. Um, I just want to come to Charlotte because I know she's got to rush off. I think there's some, some other lessons. Some questions, I'll come back to Maria and Paul. I've got some follow up questions for Maria actually. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for having me. It's been a really good discussion. Just some like closing remarks. Um, I think it's really important that we recognise the challenges of the current century, especially as climate change is impacting us in the UK a lot more than it has been um, in recent years, as we've seen with you know the London flooding, but also flooding across the UK, especially in the West Midlands, where I'm from. Um, and I also agree that we need to ensure we're also looking at things like retraining with the question on uh, if we should continue advertising high carbon, jo high carbon jobs. I know when we talk about jobs that won't exist in the future, we have mentioned high carbon jobs in you know, PSHC lesson at school. So that's definitely a consideration that we're having. But in order for us to you know, still maintain a workforce and still maintain those good workers, as um, has already been said, we need to ensure that we have retraining measures that mean that we still maintain those skills and maintain those workers um, and also have an education system that prepares people who aren't yet in work, um, as well as apprenticeships and vocational courses that mean people entering the workforce are supported through education to continue contributing to a green and climate society. I also think that we need to ensure that we're not just incorporating climate and environmentalism into all of this, but climate justice. We know that the climate crisis is disproportionately going to impact people who are less privileged. Um, and we also know that with the most, like the bulk of green jobs, things like manufacturing, those are going to be taken by people who are probably from um, working class backgrounds, as are things like vocation courses and apprenticeships. So not only do we need to make sure that we have climate and environmentalism into those things, we need to look at how best we support these communities and support people in those roles. Um, just not expecting them to carry out quite like hard labour without thinking about how we can tackle inequality in the sector um, and tackling inequality in training too, because we do know that there's a high discrepancy between things like A-levels and BTECs, and that shouldn't be the case because every worker should be valued. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, good luck with the rest of your schooling. Thank you very much for speaking here. It's great, carry on, good work. Yeah, and the, the question I want to follow, follow up with is that on the um, the, the jobs and skills part, uh, you, you've made final recommendations now. Is that right, or have you got have you got another set? So you are you waiting for the government response to it? Is that right? So I, I, a couple of questions. What if, if there's one thing the I know you've got a whole series of recommendations, but if there's one thing you wanted the government to do, uh, what would it be? Another question. For me. Um it would be publish the net zero strategy because everything comes from that. If we can have a, if we can have an economy wide view of what needs to get done by when, um, I think it enables the unions to think about how they adapt their workforces, where they need to reskill. It allows business to think about technologies we invest in and therefore the skills we need to pull through. It allows the education uh, and academics to think through, well, how does this fit for us? So, um, it, it, it creates investment and demand. And so I think that's really important. Yeah. And what, yeah, so absolutely, except the government needs to, uh, the government accepts it needs to print the, um, the net zero strategy. I think we've all been waiting for it for some time, but fingers crossed it will come soon. Um, yeah. I was just wondering what you saw so for your other recommendations, uh, what, what barriers there were that you saw from government, what might stop it uh, implementing them? Because often their recommendations are either and yeah, not talking about yours or in other areas, either they've got a cost attached to them and suddenly you know the government works out, thinks about value for money in some way, uh, or there are uh, they they think there's other considerations that there'll be other sort of secondary uh, impacts on other groups of people, say, or whatever else, which is why they may not do it. I'm just wondering if what, what you saw as barriers, or do you think really the government should just be able to implement them all? Um, I think one of the barriers is always funding. Um, it, this wasn't a report where we felt that we should be saying we, we need more funding for everything. That, that's not the world we live in, but where we've got the funding, we should make it explicit and put, make it linked to pulling through green jobs and skills. So one of the recommendations was where there are COVID recovery programmes, can we make sure that they have explicit link to green jobs and skills and the green recovery? 
Um, the other, one of the other um, barriers I think for government, and, and, and it wasn't, it was it, the government did a brilliant job on the report of working between Bayes, the Department of um, Education, and then also Department of Work and Pensions were involved. And they did a great uh, effort between the three departments. But I think that climate change and net zero are not is not one owned by one department. Everybody's going to have to pull pull together. And I think that can sometimes be challenging. But the other piece, um, particularly on the just transition, was how do we loop in local authorities and how do we diversify local economies, particularly in areas where there's um, lots of industry that's going to probably struggle to decarbonize. So what's the, it's not just a central government thing. It's um, also responsibility and actions can be delivered by local government. Um, um, can you hear me okay? Sorry, the line is very dodgy on Zoom and my work laptop. So fine, yeah. um, so as an organization that um, so I work from that office and we are involved in producing climate change resources for use in the classroom. Um, but we know that there's a huge amount out there um, from other organizations, all varying in quality. Um, that's going to become ever more um, important or uh, there's gonna be more and more resources as we approach COP26. So I'm really interested in how organizations government, whoever, can support teachers in that short to medium term to do what people like Starlet have been asking for, to deliver more climate related content in the classroom and really prepare young people for the future that lies ahead? You mean it's not really about the issues and the shortage of resources, it's how you match the people. Uh, exactly. How do we support teachers to find authoritative information? Because there's so much out there. Um, and obviously we want young people to be hearing from all of those organizations that are producing really quality resources. Um, and there is a huge piece around the confidence. So many, many different studies, whether it's ones that we've done as the Met Office or organizations like STEM Learning have shown that teachers really lack confidence talking about um, climate change related subjects whether that's climate change itself from the science basis all the way through to some of the aspects that Starlet was talking about there's a lot of a lack of confidence there so how can we support teachers in kind of the short term over the next year two years five years to um, start to deliver really quality climate content in the classroom all over to you yeah, I think the situation at the moment is we rely on teachers' uh, individual enthusiasm. And so mm. it's students, if they are lucky, will have a teacher or a group of teachers within a school who feel passionate about this and therefore make sure it has the time and space within their school community. I think um, so, so there's a problem in the sense that the moment we rely on individual enthusiasm, what needs to happen is it needs to be made mandatory so that this is something that's compulsory for all teachers, all schools to engage with and give space and time within the curriculum. And then I agree that, that I've especially seen this leading up to, to COP26. Um, there's just a proliferation of, of resources. Teachers are being flooded with the resources and I, that is not what we need. Teachers don't have the time in order to go and, and um, mm. absorb these resources as much as they then also don't know which ones, like you say, are the ones that are best or most appropriate or suited. I think we need some direction from the Department for Education to say that this is uh, the expectation and, and let's hope this comes in November, that um, schools are set an expectation of what they must uh, engage with and what teachers must must kind of communicate and convey but I think in terms of that actually happening it does need space and time for teachers to have the ability to engage with this particularly as I've seen this over the last 18 months schools have been squeezed and that's understandable but the um, emphasis on sustainability and the climate and nature emergency is one of the things that has dropped off schools are beginning to pick this back up leading up to November but um, lots of schools have just said we we don't have the time or space in order to engage with this and, and that's not where we need to be we need to make sure that this is compulsory thank okay. you paul Rian, i think you had your hand up again yeah i just wanted to come in and say i think there is a role for 
um, other organisations and businesses to, to support with this. I mean, we might not be in the classroom every day, but I mean, Grid, we have a lot of very engaged, activated employees and we're doing a lot around COP. So we should be going in to the schools and talking about it and inspiring and motivating as well. It doesn't just need to be something the teachers do. Okay, that's great. I'm going to, we've got a couple of minutes, uh, uh, a couple of minutes, study, but I'm going to call them um, uh, call it time. I've actually got to go physically somewhere else by two o'clock. Uh, but thank, thank you very much, uh, Rian. Thank you for all the uh, Scarlett earlier. Uh, it's obviously fascinating discussion. It's, and I look forward to seeing you down on the possible uh, recommendations. And again, obviously, if we look back. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your time and uh, see you again soon.